Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, cities show how hard it can be to find the balance in reopening. It just again reasserts that you have to be more cautious and more careful. As Ontario moves ahead, what lessons are there in the rest of Canada? We're asking the Liberal government to make sure that Justin Trudeau comes to this committee and testifies. A parliamentary ethics committee gives Justin Trudeau a temporary reprieve. Courage is not the, the opposite of cowardice. Courage is actually the opposite of conformity. As a CFL team confronts its name, we talk with former Commissioner Jeffrey Orridge. And to this new sir with love from a nation. A very British scene in the fight against COVID-19. This is The National. We have all sacrificed a lot to flatten the COVID-19 curve, but now a new dilemma, jumpstarting the economy without boosting the rate of infection. Tonight, we look at those elements at play across Canada. Welcome news for many from Ottawa. Another $50 billion in aid for small business owners, including those in Ontario, now taking its first steps into phase three. But in some regions already reopened, reminders tonight that COVID-19 can come back quickly like Calgary, which has seen a recent spike. That's where Carolyn Dunn starts our coverage. Hitting a just opened amusement park was the perfect antidote for many sick of being cooped up for months. She has been waiting. She has been asking about Calloway and, and we're so glad that it finally opened. Though not exactly as usual, staff in PPE, disinfecting rides and most guests in masks. Measures that made Grant Cummings and his daughter Brooklyn feel secure. It just again reasserts that you have to be more cautious and more careful. So that's why we're wearing masks and we brought the hand sanitizer and conscious of any surface that we touch or that she touches. But it's not all fun and games in Alberta. It has the highest number of new cases per capita in the country. Just in the past couple of weeks, new cases began to rise rapidly. Today, they're at levels not seen since May. A majority of cases in people under 40. Nursing student Kyle McKenzie is staying vigilant. It's very scary to see uprises, especially after such events like Canada Day. I do have a solution of anti-disinfectant, so I wipe down everything before I touch it. Two densely populated areas of Calgary are under special COVID watch, with more than 50 active cases per 100,000 people, making Calgary's mayor visibly frustrated. Very poor masking, very poor um, adherence to physical distancing. What did you think was going to happen? Susanna Mason has been wearing a mask to protect her in-laws. I'm also traveling home to Nova Scotia on Sunday um, to visit my family. So again, Nova Scotia has very few cases, so don't want to bring anything back to my family. So far, public health officials have been reinforcing messages about hygiene, masks and physical distancing. But if there is a sustained increase in hospitalizations and ICU patients, Alberta could be looking at going back to previous lockdown measures. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Despite Quebec's surge of 800 new cases in one week, bars will stay open. The Premier, Francois Legault, says the real problem is private gatherings. Je vous laisse prendre une photo du masque qui est tellement beau. The province says 35% of the new cases are from house parties, with only 5% connected to bars. Legault warned Quebecers to be prudent, follow health guidelines, and avoid big get-togethers, a message echoed in Toronto today. Those guidelines are not put out there to spoil people having a good time. They're put out there to keep people well, so that we don't have any backsliding on the health numbers. Look at how well we're doing because people have been listening to the health guidelines when it comes to physical spacing, when it comes to wearing face coverings. Look at how Despite well that apparent progress, the Greater Toronto Area has not yet been cleared to join Ontario's Stage 3 of reopening, nor have the Hamilton, Niagara or Windsor, Essex regions. But today the rest of the province entered what's called Stage 3. That includes Stratford, well known for its stages home of a Shakespeare festival. Its theatres can now reopen, but as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, it is not so simple. Show day in a pandemic is like none other. We're 
throwing down a stage, sanitizing all of the chairs, putting up the signs for social distancing. Right, what's next? Rather than remount shows that were abruptly canceled, these artists are reinventing an intimate outdoor series now for a bigger audience than they had originally hoped. I was crossing all of my fingers and all of my toes that we were going to go into stage three before we opened. Say it. Gatherings in Ontario can increase to 50 people indoors and 100 outdoors. Of course, this city is known around the world for something far bigger. For decades, the main attraction has been the Stratford Festival. This is just one of its theaters that usually seats 1,800 people. Five, six, seven hundred people are sort of the minimum of being able to mount something and, and see uh, uh, an ability to have a return. Reopening for small groups isn't practical, so the theater is staying dark and the company is asking Ottawa for $8 million to avoid deep debt and years of scaled back production. I am very worried that without a government investment, we are going to lose something that is of extraordinary value to Canada. You can find it's also a driving force of tourism dollars to the city. For every single ticket we sell, and we sell a half million, a further $300 is spent in the local economy. This dining room reopened today. Any other year, it would be packed with theater goers. I think it's scary for everyone. But the owner hopes new ideas, from the outdoor theater to partnering with a spa and hosting more small events and weddings can help bring people back. It's like we're all little birds now leaving the nest, you know. The festival has nurtured um, us, has brought the clientele in. I can't take now. It's their turn. While thousands of beloved seats sit empty. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Stratford, Ontario. For workers at one out of every five businesses in Canada, a part of their paycheck comes from Ottawa. The federal wage subsidy program may be the thin line between a shaky status quo and a catastrophic collapse in Canadian jobs. As David Cochran explains, it's extended until December and about to get bigger. To make sure that people have the resources they need. The original wage subsidy failed to take off like the government hoped, so the finance minister is rolling out what amounts to a whole new program. As we've gone along, we've always tried to improve those programs when we need to and change them as necessary. The problem with the original subsidy was what businesses called the cliff. To qualify, a business had to show their revenue dropped by 30%. But if revenue inched even slightly above that mark, they lost the entire subsidy, fell over that cliff, and couldn't make a go of it. We know that the requirement that businesses have a 30% reduction in revenue is not helpful in that regard. So what we're saying is that businesses will get the wage subsidy if they've had any reduction in revenue which means the cliff is gone, replaced by a sliding scale. The bigger the revenue drop, the bigger the subsidy, with all subsidies declining over time as economic activity is expected to return to close to normal. But there's also a 25% top-up for businesses hit hardest, those who lost more than half the revenue for a three-month period. And that's the approach we've taken on this, which I know will help many, many more businesses. I feel like I need some sort of degree to understand what it was. Jeff Clark owns a travel agency with four full-time employees. With planes grounded, he had to lay off two. This extension buys him time, but doesn't solve his problems. We just don't know where we're going to be in three months or, or you know, a year from now. The longer this goes, the worse it's going to get for everybody. The small business lobby says these changes are an improvement, but warns there may need to be even more if reopening goes poorly or if there's a second wave. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And an update now on a COVID-19 outbreak inside a Vancouver neonatal intensive care unit. BC's health officer, Bonnie Henry, says an investigation has been launched and the situation is under control. There's no infant in the NICU at, at St. Paul's right now who um, has a, a severe illness or worrisome illness at all. So that's good news, but we'll obviously be watching very carefully. Um, so Dr. Henry confirmed that family children, members and even, staff were also exposed to the virus, but she believes their risk is also low. She said most babies and very young children who get COVID deal with it very well. 
There were 75,000 newly confirmed COVID-19 cases in the United States today. That is a one-day record. It's grim, but not shocking. The seventh record-breaking day in the United States this month alone. And this is about more than just a few hot spots. Over the past two weeks, the average daily number of new infections has surged by 30% or more in these states, by at least 50% here, and shot up 75% or more here. You might think this kind of crisis demands a unified response, but as Salima Shivji shows us, divisions run not just between states, but within them. Widely seen on the streets of D.C., but venture outside of large cities and masks aren't as common. For some, the piece of cloth is still a symbol of government smothering freedom. In Utah, that anger cut short a county meeting. We are supposed to be physically distancing, wearing masks, and so... In Georgia, it's become a legal battle, pitting the Republican governor against Atlanta's Democratic mayor. Today, he's refusing to back down on a lawsuit to block the city's mask order. While we all agree that wearing a mask is effective, I'm confident that Georgians don't need a mandate to do the right thing. He says forcing people is wrong and puts too heavy a burden on businesses. The governor is putting politics over people. It is a complete waste of time and money to file suit against the capital city of the state in which he is supposed to lead. Georgia is one of 18 states in a red zone, according to an unreleased document prepped for the White House Coronavirus Task Force. States where health officials want to see masks everywhere and bars and gyms closed. Florida also on that list, leading the way in infections and hospitalizations. But not about to close anything back down again, says the governor even though mayors are threatening to go their own way and issue stay-at-home orders. This has not changed in any way, uh, then we're all going to do it. And, and whether or not the governor wants us to or not. The country's top in infectious states, disease in specialist has some advice for the local effort. To be as forceful as possible in getting your citizenry to wear masks. All of this leading to a disjointed and contradictory patchwork of rules in a country far outstripping all others in virus cases and deaths led by a president who'd rather talk about anything else. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. There are positive developments in the quest for COVID-19 vaccines, and CBC News is tracking them. Our online interactive shows you the top-tier vaccine candidates from around the world and from Canada, tracking how far development has progressed, explaining the technologies each vaccine relies on and the pros and cons that come with them. You can search for CBC News coronavirus vaccine tracker. For the second straight day, the Prime Minister faced parliamentary questions over his ethics. It's about a federal contract that went to the charity WE, which has financial ties to members of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's family. Olivia Stefanovic reminds us that with the minority government, the Liberals no longer control where the committee goes next. We want to hear Justin Trudeau speak because it's Justin Trudeau who put his family in this situation. It Opposition members want to know what Justin Trudeau knew and when. We heard from uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau once that uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant and um, this motion is an effort to uh, achieve that effect. But in a hearing with limited time. If we take a look at the you know, 5,000 years of reliable human history. The defensive tactics were pretty blunt. We are not an investigative body. With a bunch of long speeches, Liberal MPs ran out the clock, delaying a vote on calling the Prime Minister to testify about the $900 million contract his government gave to the WE charity. I don't think they built up a lot of goodwill that would give us reason to think that uh, they're going to move a motion or support a motion to have uh, Justin Trudeau appear next week. But goodwill is exactly what the NDP is relying on with a catch. Appear. Thank you, We Day! Or have Trudeau family members' financial dealings with We publicly exposed. We're asking the Liberal government to make sure that Justin Trudeau comes to this committee and testifies. Uh, and if that's the case, then the records of the family can just be transferred to the Ethics Commissioner and it'll save them um, uh, more embarrassment. The Ethics Commissioner is already investigating the Prime Minister and Finance Minister Bill Morneau, as two other House of Commons committees probe the government's dealings with we. 
the Liberals seem to be open to the idea of transparency. I do think Canadians are no owed a broader explanation. Morneau says he will appear before the Finance Committee, a sign of the limited options the minority government faces, with the opposition calling the shots unless the Liberals can find a way to splinter their ranks. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Quebec police were out of greater numbers today as they continue the manhunt for Martin Carpentier. Officers have been joined by reinforcements, including several from Quebec's Wildlife Ministry. Police have been searching the area southwest of Quebec City for more than a week. The 44-year-old is still believed to be hiding. Carpentier is suspected of killing his two young daughters, whose bodies were found last Saturday. Officials are urging the public to call police if they see anything. Uh, I understand you're entering a not guilty plea. That's correct, Your Honor. Not guilty pleas today from three men charged with the murder in the February death of Ahmad Arbery. Arbery, whose black was killed while jogging in South Georgia. The case spurred outrage across the United States after cell phone video of the shooting appeared online. In Nova Scotia, the residents of some black communities are closer to achieving something they've claimed for more than two centuries. Systemic racism may have kept them from it, but now their use of the legal system may be the key to getting it. Kayla Hounsel has the story. Families have lived for generations in North Preston, one of Canada's most historic black communities, but many of them don't own the land. It can be frustrating sometimes, but it's a long journey, long process, and what can you do? The problem dates back to the 1700s. Black settlers, including loyalists, were given land in exchange for their support during the American Revolution, but they were never given legal title. A Nova Scotia law passed in the 1960s was supposed to help people like the Downies get it, but last year their application was denied. I knew it was wrong. Lawyer Scott Campbell took the case to court. The Downies' claim had been denied because they hadn't lived here for 20 consecutive years, but the judge said that was unreasonable, creating a hurdle when the law was supposed to make things simpler. He said African Nova Scotians have been subjected to racism for hundreds of years in this province. It is embedded within the systems that govern how our society operates. That is a fundamental historical fact and an observation of present reality. This is an important case. This is a very important issue, not just to Mr. Downey, but also to all of the communities who are uh, supposed to be helped by this piece of legislation. It's a good feeling now because it's been like so many years. I'm just happy inside that we're finally getting what we want. This is not a property issue, this is a human rights issue. This lawyer says so many others are caught in the bureaucracy. I don't have numbers, just too many. I can tell you people have died waiting. The province says it accepts the court's decision and will review previously denied applications. As for the Downies, they still don't have a deed. They've just cleared the first step. I just pray and hope that we don't have to wait that long for them to do it. And she hopes others will also keep fighting for what they deserve. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, North Preston, Nova Scotia. It was quite a day for the Queen from attending a wedding to awarding a knighthood. The wedding was that of her granddaughter Beatrice, Andrew's daughter. COVID-19 made it a private affair, though pictures are said to be coming soon. But the knighthood, well, that was public, featuring a man who, through the pandemic, has become a hero. Margaret Evans has that story. For the man who walked his way into the hearts of a nation at one of its darkest hours, there was another walk today for Captain Tom Moore to take. Doesn't everybody get the chance to see the Queen, is it? He can be forgiven for accepting a ride, family in tow, and humor intact. I don't, if, if I kneel down, I'll never get up again. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. Huh? Thank you. Amen. And soon he was in the courtyard at Windsor Castle waiting for the Queen, sometimes a little impatiently. When she arrived, it was the most tentative and touching of meetings. Two guardians of a bygone era who offered Britain's hope during the COVID-19 lockdown. But this was Captain Tom's day, now Sir Tom. Moore raised millions of pounds for Britain's National Health Service when it was struggling under the weight of the coronavirus, with one of the highest infection and death rates in Europe, his own generation the hardest hit. He walked 100 laps of his garden in the lead to his 100th birthday and offered up a little optimism along the way. 
the sun will shine on you again and the clouds will go away. Now he's a household name with a whole cupboard full of honours, including one from the English soccer team. To have Sir Tom as, a, as our captain, um, yeah, doesn't get any better than that. There's even a Lego version of Moore and the Queen. Back in the real world, there was a little chat about lockdown and the weather. And then we had a nice day, too. Yeah. Yeah. Then, don't forget the handbag, cue the bagpipes, and the Queen was on her way, watched by her newest knight of the realm, standing in the circle of his family's love and that of the watching nation. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Russian police raided the home of yet another anti-Putin activist. It's kind of definitely an assault on someone who fights and represents Western Valley. Up next, why this time it's his Canadian citizenship that's the crime. Plus a conversation about race in sports. I did get hate mail. It was racially charged, it was racially motivated. What former CFL commissioner Jeffrey Orridge thinks about this moment in time. And later, how one couple chose to say, I do. You know, kiss each other, that's <laughs> the cross-border wedding that brought two families together. We're back in two. Russian authorities aren't letting COVID-19 get in the way of its clampdown on dissidents. It's going after a Moscow man for not declaring that he's also a citizen of Canada. Chris Brown has his story. Peter Verzilov has a big mess to clean up in his Moscow apartment. That police raided the home of a prominent anti-Putin activist isn't a surprise, but he says the crime they accused him of was failing to officially disclose he's a Canadian. It's kind of definitely an assault on someone who fights and represents Western values in Russia, values that are important in Canada. Verzilov has had dual Russian-Canadian citizenship since he was a teenager, when his father lived and worked in Toronto. In Russia, Verzilov is a hero to some and a villain to others for stunts such as storming the pitch in front of Vladimir Putin during the World Cup in Russia. He helped form Pussy Riot, which has infuriated the Kremlin and church leaders with its anti-government punk music performances. Russian authorities are obviously very uh, scared that something new will happen. So in this way, they see me as uh, more dangerous than any terrorist in Russia because terrorism is something they could easily deal with and that they know how to deal with. Journalists and opposition figures have been targeted in a sweeping crackdown of late. There were mass arrests in Moscow on Wednesday, and in Russia's Far East, the arrest of a governor who beat out a Kremlin candidate has triggered a week of protests. In September 2018, Vrzilov claims he was poisoned and that Russia's security services was the only group that could have pulled it off, though nothing's ever been proven. But he says prosecuting him now on a technicality is a stretch even for the police who searched his apartment. Uh, yeah, the investigators are obviously joking about, uh, about all these things, about hockey sticks, and uh, they said maybe you have like a, a beaver uh, living in your apartment somewhere. Well, not a real beaver anyway. Police confiscated his passport, but Vrzilov believes he'll get it back after our trial later this summer, where he's expecting to be found guilty and fined. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, my conversation with the first black commissioner of a major North American sports league. I believe that we cannot continue to do the things that we've been doing the same old way. Jeffrey Orridge on the racial reckoning in sports and elsewhere. Welcome back. The Canadian Football League's Edmonton team will reportedly change its name. TSN and Post Media say the Alberta club has made the decision, though the team hasn't confirmed it. This comes after the NFL's Washington franchise announced it was getting rid of its nickname, which many consider offensive. This week, CBC Sports has been investigating race and diversity in coaching and management in Canada's sports industry. And someone who's seen that firsthand is former CFL commissioner and former CBC executive Jeffrey Orridge. Hello, hi, I'm here, I'm here. With his appointment to the CFL, Orridge became the first black commissioner of a major sports league in North America. We were thinking about how do we showcase our product and our brand even better, 
and it goes along with my strategic plan in terms of stars, stories, and big events. But the Canadian Football League is just a small part of his impressive resume. Harvard Law grad, general counsel for USA Basketball, senior roles at Reebok, the CBC, Canadian Tire, and currently the Black North Initiative, which describes itself as committed to removing anti-black systemic barriers. I spoke to Orridge via Skype. Jeffrey Orridge, really nice speaking with you this evening. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. We've heard a lot of stories of, of people encountering police bias, and for you, growing up in the United States, uh, no exception. Uh, tell me about Colorado Springs. It was unfortunate. I became the first general counsel at USA Basketball, which ultimately became the dream team. And uh, in moving there from New York City, I remember the first month I was there, I was stopped three times by the Colorado Springs Police Department on my way home from work. That behavior really didn't stop until uh, the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee offered to intercede and introduce me to the Colorado Springs police chief uh, to let him know who I was and, and what I was there for. Boy, uh, for a lot of Canadians, that story will seem extraordinary, but unfortunately, from what we've been hearing, not unusual. You eventually come to Canada. You become the, the head of CBC Sports. And I remember that time because people would never refer to you as the Harvard Law guy or the former basketball executive, sometimes as the American, but always as the black guy. Um, what was it like at CBC and then later on at the CFL to be the black guy? Well, I don't think anybody really wants to be defined by the color of their skin. Um, I would have rather been uh, referred to as, uh, as the really intelligent guy, <laughs> the extremely competent guy, maybe even the good looking guy. <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the designation of, of black um, typically has negative connotations in our society. And, and it's often seemed as being somewhat, something less than. And if they were referring to me as the black guy because I was the only one in that environment or in that atmosphere, then that's even more of a problem, I, I think, the fact that I could be designated as the black guy. So sometimes, you know, you, you try to read the subtle signs of what does somebody actually mean by calling you the black guy. Um, other times you don't have to read the signs. It, it's explicit. And you got some really disturbing emails when you were the commissioner of the CFL. Well, I did get hate mail, and it wasn't necessarily because of the decisions I made um, as commissioner of the CFL that affected one team or another. It was racially charged. It was racially motivated, and it was very blatant. In, in many respects. And so it was everything from my Twitter account to actually receiving mail a at home, um, which was, which exposed the bigotry that many people had in this country, which was shocking to me because I didn't think that it existed in Canada. You know, we, we do live though in a time of optimism in the United States, but I think especially in Canada, and there may be people who are watching this right now who are saying, they need to change their hiring practices. I mean, maybe, Jeffrey, they're even saying, we need a black guy or, or a black woman. What would your advice be to them? My advice would be that you need to hire the best person available. And research has shown, though, that by expanding your talent pool and accessing um, a diverse uh, group of, of people, having diversity of thought and experience and background, will deliver better results. I've been in the business of sport for over 30 years, and every organization that I've worked for looks for a competitive advantage, and that's how you get it. But you have to identify the talent, cultivate it, train that talent, and give them equal access and, and equal um, opportunity to actually perform. And I think that's the crux of things right now. And, and once again, um, it, it is not, courage is not, the, the opposite of cowardice, um, courage is actually the opposite of conformity. And I believe that we cannot continue to do the things that we've been doing the same old way uh, with, without expecting the same old results. And that's why we're having this national conversation, which is hopeful and heartening. But you know, there are some people probably listening right now who are saying the system now chooses the best people. And if we have to go out of our way to hire people of color, that means lowering our standards. I beg to differ. I think that uh, I know that there are a, a huge amount of unresourced, underexploited, um, underrepresented talent 
in 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 Canada. Um, all that's necessary is equal access and equal opportunity. All we want to do is level the playing field to give everybody an opportunity to contribute because there are uh, gems within our within our society that just are, are not exposed because they they don't have the talent. They they they're just not sourced. Fifteen seconds left. Let me ask you this: Are you optimistic? I'm extraordinarily optimistic. I moved to Canada uh, because I believe in Canada. I believe in this brand. I think this is the best country on earth. And um, and the fact that we're having this conversation and this national dialogue is a great first step. And the other things like the Black North Initiative um, to to further the conversation and and push the agenda to make sure that that those barriers of inequality and inequities are lowered and that everybody has equal access to equal opportunity. That initiative, of course, something you're involved in. People can look it up to find out more about it. And I got to tell you, real pleasure speaking with you tonight. Thanks, Jeffrey. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Still ahead on The National, the video gaming industry is experiencing a reckoning of its own. How those speaking out are trying to change the game. But first, Greta Thunberg marks a new milestone, how her climate strikes inspired Jane Fonda's activism. That's next. Today marks 100 weeks since Greta Thunberg began her public action against climate change. Her school strikes for climate in Sweden soon became known everywhere as Fridays for Future, a global movement that's been taken up in many Canadian cities. It was driven by students, but it attracted supporters of all ages. Case in point, Jane Fonda, a longtime climate change activist. Inspired by Thunberg, Fonda initiated so-called Fire Drill Fridays. Before the pandemic hit, Susan Ormiston spoke with Fonda in Washington. Jane Fonda has always been, well, Jane. Talented, passionate, opinionated, a successful actress and businesswoman for 50 years. On a Friday in Washington, she joins a jumble of people at a Lutheran church to marshal a march against climate change. Jane Fonda is an activist again. Y'all ready for today? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fonda has agreed we follow her on this so-called fire drill Friday. This city is consumed by the prospect of impeachment. Why are you here now? Because this is when I could come. I got the idea um, the beginning of September. Inspired by Greta Thunberg, I decided I needed to leave my comfort zone and put my body on the line and engage in civil disobedience and risk getting arrest because we need to step up with bolder actions now. It's a real crisis. Greta is a teenager. You're in another season of your life. What have you learned through your experience that helps in this type of cause? I'll tell you what I've learned. People who are organized can change policy. People who are together, unified, and organized around a strategic goal can change anything. Where's the front of the line? The group's not large at first. Concerned citizens, veteran rabble-rousers, peppered with a few notable faces, actresses Kira Sedgwick and Taylor Schilling. Annie Leibovitz, herself famous, is shooting the scene for Vogue magazine. All right, All right, let's go, back up, back up. Diversity on land and sea is under severe attack. Fonda's been out here every Friday since September. A classic style protest. March somewhere, target something important to the cause. She's been arrested four times here for civil disobedience and once carted off to jail overnight. Part of the plot. It's quite an experience to know that you ha are powerless that you have been handcuffed and that you were completely in the control of the police. Now, because I'm white and famous, I'm not going to be treated badly, I don't think. What did your jailers say to you? Um, they couldn't believe that I was there voluntarily. <laughs> and, um, it was dramatic because all night long, other people in their cells were banging on the walls and shaking their cell doors and just howls of despair. Were you in a cell by yourself? Yes, I was put in a cell by myself. 
A guard was put outside my door. That freaked me out more than anything. Who were they guarding me from? The only people that could get in were guards. You know, I mean, it's, you sleep on a metal slab. It's not pleasant. I mean, there are cynics. You've met them all your career and your life saying, oh, this is a celebrity stunt with a famous actress, you know, but really, is this the type of pressure that will change anything? Yeah, well, I'm not alone. This is part of a movement. So what do you bring, Jane Fonda? I bring celebrity, and that's very important. You wouldn't be here interviewing me if I wasn't a celebrity. What does that do? Is it going to change policy? No, but it's going to wake people up. It inspires them, and it gives them a role model for what they can be doing. Today's target is BlackRock a big global investment company. A splinter group gets ahead to occupy the front of the DC offices. They've invested more than $90 billion in fossil fuels. And what do you want them to do? Divest. To divest. From the fossil fuel industry. If we have just 10 years to stop the climate crisis, and if we don't, we're all going down with them. We need a planet more than, we, than BlackRock needs their profits. Are you going to try to go in? Uh, we're not sure yet. Police know they're coming. A downtown street is shut down. Watch out for the sidewalk right now. The crowd's growing larger now. Fonda is pushed to the middle and she takes up her post. At Standing Rock and Monacare. But leaves room in front for the young activists. She takes her role seriously and with huge energy. The young people who all around the world by the tens of millions have bravely struck from school on Fridays and they've inspired us all folks to stand up with them and I'm so grateful don't stop and we won't stop either thank you if we continue to place our health and safety in the hands of utility executives. Fonda is no stranger to activism, woven through her career with protests from indigenous and women's rights. Silence is no longer an option. To the Iraq war and the Alberta oil sands. The eyes of the world are on this area. Provoking controversy still today. Accept it, Jane. You failed with repeal 77, you're gonna fail with the Green New Deal. We don't need you here in DC. You know, look at this. This is Jane Fonda's mugshot from 1970. Back then, Fonda was a famous agitator in the anti-war movement, earning the nickname Hanoi Jane after she posed with the North Vietnamese. She later apologized. But in 1970, fresh from an anti-war speech in Canada, U.S. authorities pounced. You were arrested crossing the Canadian-U.S. border right. back in 1970? Arrest. Yes, that was my first. That was what was the, that for? The police told me this. We are on orders from the White House to arrest me, seize all my records and my phone books and everything, and um, accuse me of smuggling drugs, which were actually vitamin pills. But they were pretty rough. The cops were, were rough, and it was orders from the White House. They wanted to stop your uh, Vietnam yeah. protests. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience? Because you were criticized as Hanoi Jane for some of that, and you apologized later in life. So you must have learned something from that that right. you took forward. Don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> Just keep going. You know, the more they attacked me, the more I dug in my heels. If they thought I was some, you know, s some soft, Hollywood starlet, daughter of Henry Fonda, and they could bully me. No, I, I wasn't going to let them get me. I just kept going. You still feel that way? Yeah. Only see now, I'm old. And uh, so I feel even more capable of standing up. Wells Fargo, you must divest. The afternoon's getting long. Seven protesters have now locked themselves to the doors of Wells Fargo, a US bank. They're chained to the bank. Um, yeah, you know, they can't use their hands, so uh, we're providing them with, with water and um, cough drops. And are they prepared to be arrested? Uh, that's up to them. What side are you on? What side are you on? Thank you so much. D.C. police are patient. Seems a small dose of civil disobedience will be tolerated this time. They know the drill, especially with Jane Fonda front and center. Shut it down. Come this way. Freedom 
the side. I don't know. They're going over there. I don't know. Why aren't we going on the side of the street? There's a car behind you. Be careful. There's a car behind you. How far is it? Back to Franklin. How far? She'll be back the next Friday and the next one till mid-January when she returns to Los Angeles to tape the next season of Grace and Frankie with comedian Lily Tomlin. <laughs> That's my girl. What would Frankie say about Grace out on the streets today getting in the back of a paddy wagon? She'd say, go Grace! <laughs> She'd love it. She may join me. Grace with and Frankie Frank. do, <laughs> do jail. <laughs> what house can you hear? Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Just days after that piece aired in December, Jane Fonda was arrested for a fifth time while protesting in Washington. She is now back in Los Angeles, where she's been hosting virtual rallies from her home. After the break, pushing for change in the video game world, how one industry is responding to its own Me Too movement. We'll be right back. The shelter-in-place ethic of the pandemic has made video games even more popular than they were already. But the industry behind them is suddenly facing what some are calling a gaming Me Too moment. Eli Glasner looks at a time of reckoning beginning with an industry giant. This is Ubisoft Forward. At Ubisoft Summer Preview. Join us. Hi, everyone. The toxic work culture at its Canadian offices went unsaid. After the articles, resignations. Gone, CCO Serge Haskaway, the creative force behind games like Assassin's Creed. Shield! Plus, the global head of HR and Yalis Mallet, the president of Ubisoft Canada. But what's happening in gaming is bigger than one company. On the Twitch streaming platform. But it's not okay, and it can't just be passed off as a, as a mistake. And on social media. Gaming community members such as Carissa are speaking out. Took all of my face and um, started to kiss me. Didn't ask her anything. CBC News agreed to interview her masked and only use her first name for reasons of personal security. In 2012, the American talent booker met a prominent video game designer at a convention. She says he got her drunk and took her to a hotel. At one point, he un undid the button on my pants and then tried to slip his hand down in there, and I stopped him. She says the bro culture of gaming covered up this kind of behavior for years, but no longer. I'm not the type of person to let somebody who's disgusting take away something I love. While more women are playing games, the industry is still mostly male. A recent survey from the Game Developers Association had only 24% identifying as female. CBC News asked to speak to Ubisoft, which declined to comment. On the company website, the CEO wrote about transforming the human resources process. The CEO of this Montreal gaming company says don't look to HR for help. HR is always there to protect the company, and they are almost legally obligated to their shareholders to calculate the value of the harasser versus the victim. Tanya Short says there's a growing push for gaming employees to unionize to protect themselves and the industry they love. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, how one couple didn't let a closed border get in the way of their wedding. Their story fit for this time, next in our moment. Jackson and Katie Jensen were engaged back in March, but Jackson's Canadian, Katie's American. And with the border closed, they couldn't get married with both of their families present. Or so they thought. They needed to get a little creative and get married right on the border, and that is our moment. Her family is from Montana and my family, we live here in Kurtzton. We had been engaged since March and we're trying to find a way to get married. I said to Katie, like, why don't we just get married at the border, then your family can watch and my family can watch. And then she kind of was like, yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea. And we just had to call like landowners and get permission from them first. And then we had to call the border crossings. They told us to call the U.S. Border Patrol and they were super helpful. And then they gave us permission to hug and shake hands through the fence. And so it made the experience a lot better and uh, really special. So we just stood and everybody watched and they stood right on the fence line and we had like the 
backdrop right on the corner of the fence so everybody was gathered around and it's a fun story to tell and we'll get to tell it forever. And the pictures of the big sky are absolutely beautiful. Uh, the father couldn't, of course, walk down the traditional aisle, but he walked down the fence line, the border between the United States and Canada, and the vows ended with customs officers on both sides asking if they had anything to declare. I made that last part up, but that would be a fitting way to end it. I think that's a fitting way to end this program. That is The National for July 17th. See you Sunday night.